Uh, hi, good afternoon. I am Maura Conway. I'm from Dublin City uh, University. Um, and I guess originally I wanted to talk about kind of violent online radicalization and weighing the role of the internet in past, uh, present and future terrorism. I'm not sure that that is the um, appropriate uh, title at this stage. Some of you may be familiar with a paper that came out in the last few weeks, I guess, where uh, somebody all of us uh, know, a guy by the name of Mark Sageman, wrote a paper called The Stagnation in Terrorism Research and it got a big response. Um, some of it, um, some of it, I guess, positive and a lot of it negative. Uh, and, and I think actually, uh, not meaning to be negative, but maybe you, I could call this paper the stagnation in online radicalization uh, research. I don't want to get the kind of response uh, that Mark Sageman uh, got, but I, I thought it was worthwhile being a little bit uh, maybe uh, provocative and whatnot. Let me uh, contextualize uh, how I came, I guess, uh, to be doing uh, some of this uh, research. Uh, I started doing a PhD in the late 1990s and I was uh, interested in ideas about the uh, globalization um, of terrorism. Uh, and originally I was sort of considering the internet as a way in which terrorism might come to be uh, globalized. And then I read this very quote by a guy called Walter Lacker, um, who is, uh, I think he's still alive, he's very very old now, like ancient. <laughs> and uh, he's a major figure, I guess, uh, early figure in, in terrorism studies and c continued to be, uh, uh, to be uh, quite influential uh, right through uh, the 1990s and whatnot. And he has a book called The New Terrorism that appeared in 1999 in which he said that no amount of emails sent from the Becca Valley to Tel Aviv, from Kurdistan to Turkey, from the Jaffna Peninsula to Colombo, or from India to Pakistan will have the slightest political effect effect. Nor can one envisage how in these conditions virtual power will translate into real power. And I was kind of left scratching my head. I was left scratching my head uh, for a number of different reasons, but one of them was because about two or three lines previously on the very same page of the book, he says, you know, uh, audio cassettes uh, smuggled into Iran from Khomeini uh, while he was exiled had a really significant impact uh, on the Iranian revolution. So he admits to the fact that audio cassettes uh, changed Iran, right? It ch changed the course of Iranian history, but he can't see how the internet, uh, he's talking about email, but he, he actually does mean the internet uh, could actually change anything in relation uh, to terrorism. So I did a PhD about the websites uh, of terrorist organizations organizations that were operating uh, in the world uh, at that time and what their purposes uh, were and how they thought uh, or how they seemed to think they might be uh, changing the world or changing the histories of their own uh, countries uh, uh, in, terms of their, uh, in terms of their online uh, strategies. Much later though, Jason Burke, uh, who wrote an excellent book uh, about Al-Qaeda, uh, in 2011 said this about Twitter. Uh, and uh, and uh, its, its effects in terms of contemporary terrorism. He said, Twitter will never be a substitute for grassroots activism. In much of the Islamic world, social media is only for super connected local elites or supporters in far off countries. Neither are much use on the ground where it counts. Social media can bring in donations or some foreign recruits. It can aid communication with some logistics and facilitate propaganda operations but it's not much use in a firefight. Twitter won't help Al-Shabaab retake Mag Mogadishu or the Taliban reach, Ka reach Kabul in any meaningful way. And I was left scratching my head once again. A, he seems to think that Twitter isn't a form of grassroots activism. Uh, B, he seems to think that not a great many people uh, in the Muslim world uh, have access uh, to the internet. That is untrue. Uh, and it's not much use in the ground, he says, where it counts. He says, oh yeah, sure, it can bring in donations. So this is the financing uh, issue. Uh, it can bring in some foreign recruits. It can aid communication. It can aid you in your logistics. It can facilitate propaganda. But really, it's not all that useful. Now, if you can get money, recruits, get your word, your uh, information out there, do some logistics, and get out your propaganda, I think those are all actually quite important steps in terms of ultimately the firefight. So 
going back again for a moment, so to the past uh, for a minute, I guess my point about the, the first two comments is that it wasn't just Lackier in 1999. People who really are informed uh, at the present time uh, seem to think that the internet uh, doesn't have a very significant uh, role to play in terms of contemporary terrorism and violent extremism. So, in 1999 also, uh, Tim Stevens and Peter Neumann uh, at the ICSR in King's in London uh, produced uh, a very interesting uh, report about the links between terrorism and the internet. And in that report they said that self-radicalization and self-recruitment via the internet with little or no relation to the outside world rarely happens. And there's no reason to suppose that this situation will change in the near future. And I thought this was an interesting one too. Um, I guess the first question we have to ask ourselves about this, I think, is what precisely we mean by self-radicalization and self-recruitment. I don't think anybody can actually radicalize themselves because politics, right, uh, is, is never uh, a, 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 a purely individual uh, kind of an activity or whatnot. Uh, the politics is, is social. All politics is social. You cannot radicalize yourself in that way. You actually do have to draw uh, on other people's ideas and philosophies uh, and whatnot. This issue of recruitment, I think, is an even more interesting one. In the European Union, uh, in their, a lot of their policy documents uh, in counterterrorism and whatnot, uh, especially as it relates to online, they talk a lot about radicalization and recruitment. And I think that uh, this is a mistake. Uh, I think we can interestingly talk about radicalization. Uh, the recruitment thing, though, is very problematic when you talk about the internet, I think. It's not an accurate uh, word. Uh, people, I would say, or many people, are not being recruited uh, online. Recruitment gives this impression, this very strong impression, that there's some recruiter uh, in existence and somebody's going out and recruiting people uh, into a terrorist organization, uh, as commonly understood. And I would say that at the present time that that probably isn't um, a hugely accurate description of what's going on uh, in many uh, instances. But more relevant here, I think, those were kind of asides, is this issue of little or no relation to the outside world. Because this is the idea that there is a place called the internet and then there's a place called the real world and that those two things are largely separate, which is very problematic uh, for people who do research on the internet, uh, for example, this uh, seeking to, uh, seeking to uh, split these into two very uh, defined and distinct uh, type of categories. Because more and more, of course, people would say who study uh, the internet, more and more the internet is integrated uh, into people's uh, everyday lives. So your online life and your everyday life, your life in the real world, right, are increasingly integrated. They are dependent on each other. They infuse each other in very uh, significant uh, ways. Which brings me to 2014, and this is the UK uh, Home Affairs Committee uh, in the last few weeks, actually, or maybe it's the last couple of months at this stage. And they say, the process of radicalization will continue. The ideology which has come to be associated with Al-Qaeda will be more resilient than Al-Qaeda itself. Extremist material on the internet will continue to motivate some people to engage in terrorism, but will rarely be a substitute for the social process of radicalization. Hence, in 2014, there are some people in the UK government who think that the internet isn't social. <laughs> and that's kind of interesting, you have to admit. So, I think that uh, there are some things we need to talk about uh, in terms of uh, terrorism and online radicalization and research uh, in this uh, area. And my personal feeling is that there are th really three uh, basic questions um, that we've not adequately tackled uh, yet. Uh, and let me say that this is uh, an insider criticism. Uh, I am guilty uh, of this as much as anybody uh, else, so I put myself firmly uh, in this category. Um, and also, I guess, uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, research in this area has not been underway for a huge amount of time. Uh, and so, of course, there are many questions to be answered, which is related to the third thing, which is about the nature of the Internet. It changes very, very fast. It's hard to research the Internet. It is fraught with difficulties. So, like I say, uh, these criticisms should be taken, uh, I guess, uh, in a spirit of uh, camaraderie, uh, if you like.
So the three basic questions that I think are not yet uh, adequately answered are these. Is it actually possible for people to be radicalized via the internet? And policymakers and media and others certainly assume this uh, to be the case. So do many researchers, uh, I would say. In particular, question two, can online interactions and or consumption of online content, violent and nonviolent, cause people to become violently radicalized? And three, if violent online radicalization is shown to occur, so if we have the data and if we can show this to be the case, well, what are the contours uh, of this process uh, precisely, or, or, or can we say something about that? And currently, I would say, in respect to these questions, there is lots of opinion. So a lot of people have opinions, and there are a lot of assumptions. There, are, there is a lot of anecdotal evidence brought to bear. So, of course, you can find cases. But there is really not a whole lot of substantive empirical data, substantive social science research that has been done uh, in this area to date. And this is very uh, problematic. And the work that has been done has focused very much on analyzing content and not analyzing the consumers of the content and the audience and the functioning of the content. Or indeed, another interesting point, what the people who are producing the content think they are doing in terms of those production processes uh, and whatnot. So who do they feel like they're influencing that? In, in other words, and then who is actually being influenced is another question. These are clearly difficult uh, questions uh, to answer, but I think they're really, really important because even if you accept in the absence of sound research, and many people have accepted that, including importantly policymakers, but on the basis of anecdotal evidence and opinion and assumptions and whatnot, that online radicalization is actually occurring. Well, how can you actually develop um, effective counter strategies, effective CVE strategies, if we don't know how it's occurring. And more and more money now is being put in by governments into CVE strategies, but they've missed a giant step, which is these questions about, well, you know, uh, what kind of content is going to be convincing in terms of these online CVE strategies? Who should it be targeted at? What platforms are trafficked by the people uh, who you wish to target, etc.? And those are the kind of, of uh, answers that nobody appears to have uh, at the present time. So, where do we go, for, uh, where do we go from here, uh, if you like? Well, I, I kind of think of six things uh, are important, and I guess you could probably uh, think of others, and I'd be interested uh, to hear those uh, too. Number one, we need to widen our research beyond jihadis. People, this is an academic term, lose their heads when, when uh, when they begin to think about uh, jihadis. And it's true, I've seen a lot of actual, I guess, lost heads on Twitter and whatnot recently. If you follow the jihadis, you'll see that in Syria, um, this, the severed head phenomenon is pretty big. But academics, right, uh, metaphorically lose their heads when it comes to jihadism. So do uh, policymakers. So I think in order to get a better handle right, uh, on things in terms of uh, violent uh, online radicalization and how it functions, uh, etc. We need to widen things out beyond the jihadis. We need to uh, stop concerning ourselves uh, with Muslims, right, purely with Muslims. And we need to ask ourselves about the whole range, and there's a vast range of them, right, other types of violent extremists out there, so-called old terrorist uh, organizations and their representatives. There are a great many of them still existing, and they're all online. Uh, Neo-Nazis and all kinds of variants um, of the far right uh, are out there, they're online, and actually m the extreme right have a hugely greater history on the internet from the 1980s, right? So they were the first people politically online, basically, uh, than the jihadis uh, have had. Uh, and then there's a range of others. Um, I guess we could uh, look at, for example, uh, the guy in the United States uh, recently who went out and, and shot uh, uh, a number of people uh, in California. Uh, and there's this whole um, online communities, it turns out, that are uh, just have as their purpose sort of misogyny, the hatred of women, uh, etc. And uh, I went and had a look and they're very hateful and it's very violent extremist. So 
We need to widen things out beyond the jihadis, if for no better reason than to do some good comparative research and to ask ourselves, uh, how is what the jihadis do different from, but also how is it similar to uh, what other violent extremists are doing uh, on the internet? So that's number one. Number two, we need to drill downwards. A lot of the work that's been done to date in this area uh, has been uh, up, done at sort of this mid-range level, and a lot of it is focused on the content. Uh, like I said, and there's some great work that looks at the content. Uh, we need to drill down, uh, I think, and we need to ask people yeah, who are producing this content, who are c consuming this content, what it is, why it is they're producing this content, who it is they believe they're targeting, and the consumers. Uh, why are they consuming it? Um, how, have they, how has it affected them, uh, etc. So we need to do some basic good old sort of social science research, some, some interviewing, um, some online ethnography, uh, or, or similar. At the same time, I think it's also worth scaling upwards. I don't want to use this term big data, but I guess it's out there. Um, I said large scale uh, data. I think we should need to do some large scale data collection and analysis. Uh, and uh, uh, David's uh, presentation was a good one because he looked at, at something very specific. He looked at the, the, uh, the uh, Westgate Mall um, attack and, and how it played out uh, on Twitter. And I think we can uh, do, certainly do that kind of work uh, and we can sort of collect uh, all of the data and there's a lot of it out there and then we can analyze it qualitatively, quantitatively, uh, etc. And use all of the different uh, tools uh, at our disposal to get you know, uh, a good uh, big picture um, of what precisely is uh, going on. Like I said already, we need to do comparative analyses. We need to compare, for example, the online activities of neo-Nazis with the online activities of jihadists. But there's uh, another way that I think uh, comparative analyses could also be useful, and that's with respect to platforms. So I think we need to do a lot more cross-platform cross uh, analysis, because today a lot of groups are not just operating on one particular um, you know, uh, social media site. A lot of groups operate across across social media platforms because if you think about it, a lot of us operate across social media platforms. You don't uh, find that many people who are only Facebook users or who are only Twitter users, but people who operate across uh, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Flickr, Instagram, etc. And so I think we need to look at specific violent extremist movements, organizations, etc., ideologies, and how they operate across specific, uh, or, excuse me, across different types of social media uh, platforms and also websites, etc. on the one hand. And then I think we also uh, need to look at how different violent extremists operate on the same platform. So what does the violent extremist landscape on Twitter look like? What does the violent extremist landscape on YouTube look like across the board? Again, not just focusing on the jihadis. Point number five, I guess, is I think we really need to explicitly begin to draw from internet uh, research. A lot of work has been done uh, by internet researchers. That is germane uh, to this particular uh, sphere. Um, they have done uh, great work about, uh, I guess, uh, like I already said, uh, the merging of the online and the o and offline. So the, the merging of people's online and offline uh, lives. Um, or for example, uh, credibility that was uh, mentioned uh, by Anne earlier. There's a huge amount of work done. It's not in the context of violent extremism or terrorism, but it's great work about credibility, how you generate credibility online, how you lose credibility online, uh, et cetera. And then there's stuff about, I guess, how people um, generate really strong social bonds uh, online. That could answer some of our questions uh, also. For example, there's a lot of great work on, on pro-ana websites, on like uh, pro-anorexia communities um, where largely young women uh, get together and, and encourage each other uh, to diet uh, sometimes until they die. Uh, and uh, it, they're very, very strong online communities. This is a social process regardless of what the UK Home Affairs uh, Committee think, thinks. Uh, it's real, it has very significant real world effects, but a lot of it is purely these friendships and these social networks are purely virtual uh, networks. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I guess, I think we need to uh, reflect on some of the ethical uh, issues here because as researchers uh, in this area, I do think that we need to think through uh, more deeply uh, how we do this research, 
probably more importantly, how we report on uh, this research in a number of different ways. And again, internet research researchers have already thought fairly deeply uh, about uh, most of or many of these issues. Having said that, the ethics issue is one that you kind of have to reflect on on a continuing basis because of the changing nature uh, of, uh, of the internet. And there isn't a lot of... Um, even in the internet research community, there's a lot of debate on what are the best ways forward, what are, the, what are ethical research pra practices in this realm. But I think uh, for now, what we need to do as terrorism or violent extremism researchers is we need to at least uh, um, get to know uh, those debates within uh, internet research and whatnot. So in conclusion then, I'm somebody who thinks that the internet uh, is playing a role uh, in uh, violent radicalization at, at the present time. That's my opinion. Uh, I don't think anybody has actually, I hesitate to word, use the word proof, but I don't think any of us have yet shown right, that this uh, is actually empirically, uh, factually uh, the case. And we need to change that. We need to show. Um, I think... It's my opinion that the internet is playing uh, a, a significant role for a whole lot of different reasons, but one of them is definitely drawing from Rapoport's uh, sort of wave theory of terrorism. If you look at, at his paper or his papers on his wave theory, what you'll see is that structural factors are very important in terms of uh, waves changing and whatnot in terrorism studies, and new communication technologies have a history of transforming uh, terrorism. From trains uh, in Russia, so in increased um, increased communication options in terms of travel options way back at the, in the 19th uh, century to newspapers, to television with respect to the Palestinians, uh, etc. So in my opinion, again, Benson has a really interesting article, which I recommend to everybody, that just came out a, a couple of weeks ago, I think, called Why the Internet is Not Increasing Terrorism. And I think that he really should have titled it, or we could retitle it, Why the Internet is Not Increasing Terrorism in the West Yet. That's me.